Welcome back to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey Can, and on today's episode, we're going to talk about digital twin and industrial automation with a company by the name of Visionize and its uh, executive vice president and co-founder, uh, David Reinhardt. David, welcome to uh, Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Thanks, Jeffrey. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I got that title right this time. <laughs> you did. <laughs> uh, Victory is all around. Uh, now, uh, let's begin first, though, with a bit about your professional background. How on earth did you end up in uh, this particular uh, uh, business? As uh, you know, you lots of things you can spend your life doing. Um, so, so why this one? And how did you get here? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's uh, you know I think a lot of us uh, we kind of find ourselves where we found ourselves, maybe by design or not. But uh, I, I started my career in engineering and construction. Uh, worked for about a decade for one of the leading oil and gas. Uh, EPCs and really got into technology in those days. And we started using 3D and laser imaging and advanced tools to really improve engineering and construction. And that piqued my interest in technology and applications to solve problems. You know, flash forward 20 years, I, I got involved with some consulting services yeah. and then co-founded uh, Visionize, where we're doing generative AI, 3D visualization and other stuff. Uh, that's that's how I got here. <laughs> Story, I you know, it's funny, we, we do stumble into our, our careers. I uh, found myself working in the oil industry quite by accident. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like I got up in the morning and said, oh, I'm going to go work there. Uh, it just uh, all just uh, ran, random uh, chance almost. Uh, so that's very familiar. Uh, now let's just dig into the business problem that you have uh, flagged that is uh, worthy of uh, time and attention to try and fix. Like, what what is it that you see out there that that uh, calls out for attention here? Yeah, I think what we see in industry, we're we're seeing even in our own lives, is there's there's more data than ever before. Uh, it's driven by equipment, sensors, uh, historian information, uh, industry for. O is coming on board. And then there's the whole change management aspect of all this stuff. Yeah. And so technology and processes uh, adopting all this new stuff and how to integrate it uh, is a big problem. And, and there's a lot of initiatives out there. And, and you know, I happen to be working with one of the world's largest oil and gas companies in the world and just how to adopt and, and how do we how do we integrate these new processes? Because it's not about technology. It's about not only the tech, but the solution it delivers and the workflow. And so there's a big data problem, uh, engineering technology, operations technology, and then what IT delivers. They, they don't line up. And so this is a big deal. And then you you add on other things like emissions and, and net zero initiatives these companies have. There's even mandates now coming out through legislation mandating solutions to minimize emissions and stuff. And so all this is a data issue. It's a technology and a process issue. And it's it's a big deal. Can you give us a give me a real example of from like, you know, your your uh, practical exposure to this and what you're what you're talking about? Just to kind of make it real for people who might not be familiar with why this is a, an issue. Because after all, when you think about it, our industrial landscape runs. We don't seem to have problems. It's a bit like a you know that proverbial duck on the surface of the water. Everything looks great, but below the waterline, things are going furiously. I mean, just yeah. share, share a story of what you mean by the, the problem you're looking yeah. at. You know, and I think that's a good example. I think when we're when we're in a state we're in, we we tend to you know we see the the calm waters, but maybe there is that turbulence under. You know, when you ask the question, I I think back to my my first car. You know, it's an old Volkswagen. I think it had like 40 horsepower, and I had to get into second gear just to get it up a hill. At the time, it wasn't a problem, but things advance. We have new technology. We have new things, and and when we look at now how these process facilities and even discrete manufacturing, how these plants are running, they need to be thinking about decarb, they need to be thinking about emissions, they need to maximize their uptime, and, and they need to work safer and with maybe fewer people, and, and all this with more data. And, and so the problems that we maybe didn't see are, are really need to be managed, and, and there is a real push, not only to improve uptime, but again, the other things we talked about around emissions and predictive maintenance and stuff like that. And, and with the advent, we're seeing a lot of things like generative AI and, and digital twin is the thing that people are really talking about. And so, so how, do we, how do we really understand all this data and then future-proof our investments to make sure we don't you know, go down the wrong trail and then have to redo or create another silo? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a, these are the things that we're tackling and we're seeing our customers and, and the industry really looking and really wanting to address now. 
And what, what is behind the pressure to do this? I think you've touched on carbon, but uh, last time I looked, oil prices are still pretty strong. Uh, there's uh, gas prices in Europe are strong. Uh, so it's not, it's not like there's a price problem here, is there? Or is it a cost pressure? Or is it a demanding challenge? There's not enough people? Or, or, or what else is behind it here? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. And I, I, think, I think for different operating companies, there's certainly different drivers. Yeah. And, and I would say, because we see, when we think about digital transformation and digital twin, you know, the, the people that we talk to around the world, they're at different levels of their maturity. You know, we, we still see clients working with Microsoft Access or maybe Excel and, and working off, you know, old, old techniques, right? Yeah. Cloud-based systems. Yeah. And we have others where they're really pushing the boundaries and they want to use generative AI and fully integrated systems. And they're really moving towards the promise of industry 4.0 and, and robots and cobots and automated systems. So, so, but all of this comes down to working safer, reducing the environmental impact. And, and I think when we look at industries like oil and gas, especially, we do see a, a retiring workforce. We see the new yeah. group coming in. You know, when I was a young engineer, you know, we were still using drafting tables. And so there wasn't a whole lot of tech, right? And, and now to, uh, let's say to recruit a great process engineer or a good mechanical engineer, you, you need to be using the, the best technologies yeah. that gets the information at their fingertips. So there's a lot of drivers and then do that safely, bring in contractors and so they know where to go, use the digital twin to plan and execute safer, faster, and more reliably. It all comes back to sustainability and uptime. Yeah, it's really, it's really a, a fascinating problem that uh, the industry wrestles with. Young people today grew up with this yeah. in, their fall, uh, in their hands, right? They're, they know no yeah. other world. So yeah. put them in front of a, a, you know, a, a, a tool sets that go back 40 years, of course, they're going to throw their hands up and, and go, yeah. what's happening here? Uh, yeah. So now the uh, different countries are at different speeds here, different um, uh, different uh, regulatory environments will have different place, different pressures on proponents. Uh, what's your perspective around this, this just the sheer spread here? Are we, are we moving to a, a common place or are we going to be living in this uh, you know, asynchronous world with some way behind, some way ahead, uh, or or the pressures from carbon really moving us to 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 coalesce at a at a standard place. Yeah, I, I think I think I think you know from from my humble perspective, it, it does look like there are different initiatives around the world that maybe some are leading and others are trailing. But I wouldn't say that there isn't awareness or consideration. Uh, you know, most of these, especially in the oil and gas space, most of these companies are global. And, and so they have, you know, they've got shareholders and people looking in. And, and so, so I, I think it's, it's definitely being looked at globally. I think from a, a decarb and a, and a, you know, sustainability approach, I, I think where we're seeing differences and it, it doesn't even have to be a global issue. Uh, you know, it, 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 it might just be operationally, maybe some older assets. We see sites we have we work with clients that have 80 year old facilities and and they just get upgraded and tuned yeah. and and you know replace in kind and expand uh, and others that are you know just oil in right now and and so there's there's a range there too and so certainly the newer sites have an advantage you know they've used newer tech to design and build and so they really have a leg up and and so the the challenge is the same operating company might own these old and new assets yep. Yep. Green and Brownfield. And so how do we get them all working in a similar way to get the benefits across their entire enterprise? And so that's part of the challenge. But I, I do think the sustainability efforts are, are global. I think everybody's looking towards that. But I would agree there's probably some stronger initiatives in some countries than others. So, yeah, there would definitely be some some real pressures coming out of Europe, I think, that are yeah. California, as example, really, really drive the, uh, the the challenges that their industry is facing. Um Let's turn to the uh, to, to, to the, the the specific solution ideas that are here uh, that, that you're working on. You said cl companies are making progress. You described digital twin. Can you just unpack that a little bit? What is the when you say digital twin? What does that actually include and encompass? Yeah. And I think that's that is the question of the hour, right? And I, I think it is a phrase that's really been tossed around yeah. and and used a lot in the last few years. Um, you know, when I first started doing things like laser scanning and using you know automated engineering tools, digital twin wasn't the word then, but but that was kind of the kernel of what we're seeing yeah. from the spatial component. 
Um, but digital twin is also the other things we talked about. It's the the engineering technologies that are used, the catalogs, the specifications, the data sheets. Operationally, it's the SCADA, the historian, uh, the sensors, you know, IoT. This is all part of that digital twin. And, and so you can have that, that data and that 2D perspective. But for us, to, to really round out the digital twin, it also needs to represent visually or spatially the facility, a virtual plant and all of its metadata and its history. And, and so that that to me is that, that umbrella, it, it covers digital twins. So it's broad and it's bold, but it's it's really, that's the thing that's going to help us solve many more of the use cases that we're talking about. It does So if I think about a digital twin in the construct that you're describing here, um, would I also incorporate things like environmental data, financial and operating performance, uh, history, uh, all, all of the above? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the end, you know, I, I, you know, I come from engineering, and so I, I, I kind of think about it in terms of the asset. Yeah. And and I think if you really break that down, if you look at the site or the unit or the, the the specific pump piece of equipment, all of that has this different metadata you're talking about. Where was it sourced? What are its financial parameters? What are its uh, maintenance work orders? Uh, that metadata. And, and so it, it's all part of that digital twin and, and the ease in which you can access it and understand it can compress the time to value to any of these use cases, whether I'm replacing, expanding, maintaining or decommissioning. And, and so, it, yes, the short answer is yes, all of all it. All of the above. And that yeah. sounds like a lot, but you don't have to start with all of it. You can start with maintenance or a decarb initiative or uh, optimizing performance. Yeah. Digital twin could also go beyond uh, the fence line, no? In other words, uh, you could you could you could conceive if you had enough collaboration between parties, you could actually conceive of a digital twin, which is uh, your business and a, a business upstream from you and one downstream for, uh, from you, where you know you're, you're you need to be working closely to to succeed. Is that a fair a fair appraisal of where this unfolds? I think so. Um, you know, it, it all comes down to. You know the the information, the inputs, and the outputs. I, one of my colleagues, he he likes to say that you know in in the coming years, every one of us in some way will have a digital twin in our lives. Maybe it's us, maybe it's our car, our house, um, and, and so it it only makes sense that the different inputs and outputs would also interoperate or work in that that digital twin space. So yeah, that makes sense to me. I never thought about it that way, but but yeah, I, I don't see why not. It all is is getting into this virtual space. And how we interact with that data to solve the problem. Again, we have more information today than we ever had. Yeah. I, I love there's a, there's a quote actually that comes from um, the Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. He said uh, in I think it was 2018. He said the pace of change has never been this fast, yet it will never be this slow again. And and I I really like that. And and data is the same way. You know, we've never had this much data, but we're going to have more tomorrow. And yeah. and so how do you make sense of it all? How do you get what you need to do your job? And have a sustainable, safe, and operating facility. That that's that's the big nut to crack. And it, it is indeed. Uh, you mentioned we all have personal digital twins. Here's mine. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I don't know how digital that is, but it Not looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I got this years ago. It was a make your own a doll of yourself. <laughs> nice. So yeah. I, I prop them up on a chair when I'm not here. People look in and go, oh, he's not here today. Uh, the um, uh, Going back to digital twin thinking, though, I think this is such an interesting uh, topic to kind of poke away at. Uh, you're right about that. I agree, agree with you completely. We've never moved as slowly. We've not, never lived in a world with so little data. So <laughs> it only goes up from here. Uh, yeah. At the same time, uh, if you think about digital twin technology, you could you could conceive of a world where your digital twin is not something offline, but something that runs absolutely in parallel and influences the piece of operating equipment you're you're running. Do you see that as part of the vision here, or is that a bit too far off in the future? No, I mean, you know, again, if I'm gonna, you know, you mentioned I come from Vision Eyes, and so I'll have yep. to puff it up a little, not only is that the vision, but that's what we're delivering today. Oh, and, and so great. for us, it's really important that not only is this a virtual representation, but it integrates and interoperates with real-time data across yeah. the enterprise. Yeah. And and so if I if I click on a circuit or a loop or, or an exchanger, I wanna know what how's it operating? Where are my deficiencies? What's the corrosion look like? Uh, what's my predictive analytics telling me about a possible failure 
And all that needs to be in real time. And, and those are the kind of things we're delivering today. Where I see it going is really more around the automation of that and maybe you know yeah. using cobots and robots and and really automating some of these decisions. But for now, these decisions can be made much more rapidly by that integration, bringing that data together in the context of the assets themselves versus pie charts and graphs and disparate systems. Yeah, it's, fair. it's a fair point. And, uh, but let's turn to how customers react when they, you, know, you walk in and, and describe this capability and the possibilities. Uh, are they open-minded to this? Are they, you know, I, oil and gas, you know, is very risk averse. We, the industry doesn't really yeah. deal well with change. So yeah. uh, how, did, how do they react to this when you share the art of the possible here? Yeah, you know what, I, I think I, I can say very confidently, they lean in and they say, wow, that looks awesome. And, and then they, they maybe recognize they have some internal challenges with their organization. And, and like you say, maybe there's risk aversion. Um, and, and so th this is true and, and the, just the adoption and, and how do I do my change management? Is this yet another thing I need to maintain? These are the kind of objections we hear, uh, innovation and change. They're not always easy. And, and we know this in our own lives and, and what we see with our, our clients and our, our, our people that we deal with. And so to, but to, but to overcome that, you know, the, the good news is I think we've really seen in, in, in today's environment, uh, sort of post pandemic, if I can quote that, yeah. people really are looking for ways of working more efficiently, working remotely, consolidating data. And so they're looking for these things. And so now how do we overcome these internal challenges maybe that we have where we're at in our maturity of data? Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things that's really important is, is pointing to successes, maybe starting with something small, um, what we like to do, and there's others in industry doing the same thing, offering an advisory service or looking at organizational readiness. But I think the desire to do this is absolutely there. And, and but because it seems like such a big thing, it also kind of takes the breath away. Oh, my gosh, can our can our organization do this? And, and the short answer is, you know, I mentioned the 80 year old facility. Uh, that's one of our clients, 80 year old plant. When we started with them, they were working in spreadsheets. Today, they have a full 3D digital twin of everything in their facility, including the tank farm. And it's integrated with multiple systems and they maintain it year on year for less than the cost that the, the benefit that they're getting from it because they're using it for you know dozens of use cases so yeah. we can get you there and and just the idea is is just taking that first step right and and so yeah i don't I mean, know if I, I answered your question i hope so i i I, well, I typically i maintain that that the place where we will see these kinds of advancements first is going to be at the uh newer greenfield plants where it's designed in there's no retrofitting it's it's yeah. built with with this intention in mind, and uh, the data is clean because it was set up to be cleanly collected, captured, and and uh, handled from from day one. Uh, I, I yeah. think to hear that that brownfields can actually do this as well is is extremely encouraging. Um, and I, yeah. think, I suspect the upside is may even be greater on the brownfields because they carry our higher cost burden to keep them going. And the challenges of getting ahead of carbon uh, in in a brownfield asset where you're, you've never historically had to even monitor your carbon profile uh, may, may create yet higher costs for you. I don't know if that's a fair yeah. appraisal, but that would be my read. That's a great observation, and it's absolutely true. I mean, when we when we see the newer facilities being built, they're using the latest engineering tools, yeah, and and those can be upgraded. Now, I like to say upgraded because it truly is a different solution. An engineering model is not a digital twin. And so the idea then to use that as a start point that then can be updated and maintained in, in near time or real time and connected is, is a real easy way to go. It's a no brainer in my mind. And, and but but the reality is, especially in North America, we have a lot of old facilities, not a lot of new refineries being built in the U.S. and Canada and other places. 30, 30 so, years so, ago, for was the last one in Canada, just as an example. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long and, time. And it's, it's been a while. So yeah. so the real, the important thing is, is to not only be able to enable that, but to enable it in a way that that delivers ROI. And, and so that's a real important part of any digital twin solution. And that's part of our secret sauce, where, where I am, is, is being able to deliver that rapidly and then be able to sustain it in a way that delivers similar greenfield values. And and, and it's absolutely achievable. And, and that's part of the, the exciting part of this whole thing. You mentioned there were some use cases that companies were kind of discovering as once you get the digital twin structure and uh, and, and this sort of uh, thorough industrial um, automation in place, 
Uh, you mentioned there's some use cases that companies surface. Are there are there some odd ones or really unusual ones that they didn't anticipate that they they're they're now te- saying, hey, this has been really really additional value we never never expected. Yeah, yeah, and and you know this is this is some of the fun part of what we're doing is is you know typically we'll we'll look at a mechanical integrity or a maintenance solution and these are again and kind of no brainers. Where's my data? How do I do it? How do I mitigate, plan, and execute efficiently? But what we saw with with one of our clients, again, in North America, is is they were really concerned about emissions and environmental impact. They had some spills. They had some some issues, and they were being fined. And and they were were able to leverage the integrated digital twin because we could demonstrate that they were doing more of a proactive approach to maintenance and predictive, predictive maintenance using the digital twin and they were able to mitigate not only these fines but they put a plan in place to reduce those kind of challenges in the future so they became more proactive versus reactive it mitigated the government pressures yeah. and also gave them a better way to operate and so they started with that use case but it ended up helping them from a legislative and a, and a sort of an oversight standpoint yeah. and now they're using it for you know multiple other use cases yeah. so that was kind of a thing that was a, a fun surprise we, we didn't say hey we've got a a legislation thing that'll keep you from getting fined, but it was a neat a neat byproduct. What are what are some of the uh, lessons that others have have been forced to learn uh, as they as they attempt to leverage these tools uh, that that you you know you, you you would highlight as things that other companies might as well get started on today if they want to take advantage of this. And here I'm thinking yeah. about stuff like just straight up data quality and data integrity. Uh, challenges with some of these facilities. Yeah, I, I think one of the things, and this may be obvious to to many, but maybe not to some, is and you talk about data. I think that's real important. Is is a lot of these sites, especially the brownfield sites, you know, they have a lot of trusted contractors, and and they're not always the same contractor, and they work in different ways. And oftentimes, the contractor does a great job of delivering maybe the turnaround or the you know the upgrade, um, but then the data doesn't always get itself back to the owner. Yeah. And and so it's really important that the owners re- recognize that they're creating new content and it's not just about having an, a construction isometric and oil in with hydro tested you know, lines, but but then get get that digital twin piece that you can roll in and use that as part of your management of change. And and you don't have to create a new silo or, or lose that information. You can you can consume that and then extend its value for the rest of the life of the, of the facility. So that's why I call it upgrading the engineering model is, is really that's a piece that some of our clients are still struggling with because they don't really understand that, that that's their data and they need to sort of own that. Yeah. And, and so that's where some of the advisory services come in. Yeah. There's a lot of work there, I suspect, in, in repairing these, these older environments to ready them to use these newer tools. Is that, is that fair to say? You know what? It, it it seems like it, and that's where sort of the the breath gets taken away because they feel yeah. like, man, this is a lot. Exactly. Huge but but monster. the reality is, yeah. yeah it, it, and and really, so it's it is a matter of sort of bringing it together and understanding where the gaps are. Mm-hmm. And and the truth is, and this is another sort of interesting aha moment was as we as we create the digital twin and we begin integrating to these different business systems, we begin to see where the overlaps and where the gaps are in ways we weren't obvious weren't obvious to us. Yeah. And and so because I click on this pump, uh, or or maybe it's fixed asset or rotating equipment, maybe I have some information over here and I have other information over there. Now I just can click on the model and I can get to it. And or I can understand, hey, I don't have this. Yeah. And so so understanding and reconciling data, it really is enabled in that digital twin process, including P and ID updates, things that are a common practice that are now can be consolidated. These these silos come together uh, instead of of really still being separated by the the user community. Yeah, the uh, I'm guessing too that um, the, the the nature of these digital twin tools uh, can create some very really interesting dynamics organizationally. Where uh, before now you might have had silos of disciplines: my mechanical engineers, quality and safety p- professionals. Uh, uh, process in in their own separate worlds with their own separate tools and models. Do these yeah. tools help bring these groups together so that they can find avenues of profitability that are beyond, you know, this a single disciplinary uh, approach to to management? Yeah, I, I think I think that, that that data management piece is another really important component. Yeah, and I, I alluded to it before is. 
you know, where we have, you know, different people with different needs, but it all comes back to the asset. And, and so by delivering the digital twin in a role-based way that allows maintenance to get the right data at the right time in the right way, that's intuitive and contextualized uh, versus inspection or operations. They all have different needs, but it all comes back to the site. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it absolutely breaks those silos down in ways that, that, you know, when I was coming up in, you know, EPC world, you know, Structural had their stuff. Electrical exactly. had their stuff. Process yeah. had nobody was, you know, and everybody was taking field trips, right? Everybody was getting hard hats on and getting in the golf cart yeah. separately. Yeah. And and with the digital twin, a lot of that goes away. And this again, it gets back to that sustainability and safe work practices. Yeah, it's a big shift uh, and a big cultural shift uh, that companies are going to go through. Have you detected after companies are using these tools for a while? Have you picked up? Uh, the the um, uh, cultural shifts or cultural change that that is taking root uh, in these organizations. And, and what I'm really getting at is, do, do these tools actually change the the ebb and flow of of um, of how these companies actually behave, their culture and their norms? Yeah, I, it's funny. Um, I hadn't thought of that until you asked the question. I was in a, I was in a meeting. We were at site one day, and then they were going through some of their turnaround planning. Yeah. And and they had they they had a digital twin that was integrated for a portion of the facility, but not for all of it. Wow. And and the turnaround planners were in there. And and this guy, I remember, uh, he he got angry because we just got done doing all the digital twin stuff, and it was really clear what to do. And then they went to the area where they had to roll out the vellum drawings and <laughs> and pull up the CAD, and he was yep. he was mad. And he's like, when are we going to get this for this area over here? And and so because it was just so much more intuitive and easy, yeah. you know, they can look at a schedule color coded on a model versus, you know, pulling out a Gantt chart in ways that just made it better. Yeah. And so so there's definitely a pull once people start getting a taste of the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> that, that's just a funny observation. I just remember based on that question. But, yeah, I definitely think there's a pull there. But but I would get back to it really does need to be part of an adoption plan, yeah. uh, you know, working with this this global one of the top, you know, the top oil and gas company, they, they had an adoption program. So as we were rolling out the, the project, they were already working on adoption, passing, you know, getting information out, having little lunch and learns and, and making sure people knew what was coming because uh, it doesn't happen automatically just because you roll out some new stuff. Yeah, so true. Yeah, I think it's uh, there, change management is, is probably at the root of, of our successes here. Uh, yeah. they, I've, I found with Digital Twin, modeling and thinking if the, if the underlying model is not well understood or the data is challenged or questioned or the operators suspect that it's a just a straight up you know job destruction initiative it's not going to go anywhere and yeah. uh, so you have to be thinking uh, bigger than that now let's just close you know, off with uh, any any lessons that you'd want to share i mean if you had to see or you want, or had a chance to talk with um, organizations out there might be contemplating doing something like this what are the, what are the yeah. two or three things they just got to do uh, before they even get get going on this yeah well i, I think certainly the, there's always a push for understanding the return on the investment you know what what is it what is it we're going to do what are we trying to accomplish and then how do we measure it and and so the, these are pretty easy with with some of the use cases that are obvious like maintenance inspection and and so certainly understanding what we're trying to do and and then i think we're also seeing that there is as part of that sort of that reluctance piece is is how, if i'm going to go down this trail is this something that's going to be supporting what i want to do in five to ten years from now that maybe i don't even know what that is yet and and so understanding how can i work with the data and have it be interoperable and then support my future goals and objectives so so that's that's a really high level answer but but i i do and i think a lot of our clients are doing that they're already you know they're being mindful and they're not just diving in um but but understanding the the, the a digital twin because of its ability to interoperate with with all kinds of data uh really is something that can be a platform to help uh, across use cases that they haven't yet thought of so having a solution that will enable that and get yeah. you to sort of the the autonomous facility and and a truly cognitive data set is is um i think where our customers are headed even if they're still working on spreadsheets <laughs> that's probably a good place to end it uh dave thanks so much for coming on the podcast today my pleasure really glad to to be here today thanks again jeffrey mm -hmm.